Celebrated author Dinesh D'Souza is with us today, who is well known not only for his books, but his provocative documentaries. Dinesh, welcome. Nice to be on with you. You've made a lot of noise across America. A little did I think when I came to America at the age of 17 with a couple of hundred bucks in my pocket that I would become an official political noisemaker. <laughs> but it's fun and I think it's needed. Our country is in an interesting and somewhat precarious time. And so I'm glad to be part of that. Now, I want you, if you would, just capsule your career for us because uh, uh, I think for those who don't know all the background. Uh, I came to America as an exchange student. I had completed the 11th grade in high school in India. I grew up in Bombay. Uh, I was an ex so I went to public school in Arizona for a year. I was lucky to be admitted to Dartmouth, so then I had an uh, Ivy League education. Um, I became a young Reaganite in college. I caught the political bug, and we had a little rebel campus newspaper there, which would, was a thorn in the side of the college administration. Uh, I then went to Princeton, came to Washington in the mid-80s to work for a magazine called Policy Review. I joined the Reagan White House for two years toward the end, 87, 88. Then I was a scholar at think tanks, the American Enterprise Institute for about 10 years and the Hoover Institution at Stanford for about eight years. Uh, and I've developed a career kind of as a writer and speaker, mainly on the political front. In 2007, I got involved in Christian apologetics. I noticed the kind of rise of the new atheism. I knew Christopher Hitchens, who was leading that charge. And so the two of us began to do a series of debates, mainly on campuses around the country. Uh, I wrote three books that deal with Christian apologetics. Um, the first one called What's So Great About Christianity, um, 2007. Uh, then I began to make movies. I started with a movie on Obama, 2016, uh, 2016, and did a movie called America, kind of a patriotic movie, and then Hillary's America, which came out uh, last year around the election time. Uh, so those movies have done really well. They're, they're actually number two, number six, and number eight of all political films. So we've given Michael Moore uh, kind of a run for his money in the political documentary genre. And um, um, so I, I now have, a, I've become a little bit of a political um, movie maker and entrepreneur. Now let's talk about the future of education because a, a lot of your background is in your documentary and I think we can skip over that. You are focused now on impacting the nation and young minds. And we know this has all been about a proselytizing or a brainwashing of young people in in our universities. We have that infamous stat that 80 to 85 percent of kids raised in church leave the church after they leave home, go to the university. Yeah, the conservatives tend to fight in the political arena and the left has recognized the importance of um, not only the universities, academia, uh, elementary and secondary education, but then also media and, uh, and movies, Hollywood, the whole world of entertainment. The vast majority of comedians are on the left, for example. So, so the left has these big megaphones and they blast them out. And um, uh, you know, my most recent book is called The Big Lie. The reason they get away with big lies is because not only do they have this sort of dominant position in these institutions, but even if someone else were to know differently, they don't have a big enough megaphone to be heard. So you can, put out, you can put out all kinds of stuff that isn't true, but people believe it because it is then echoed. Someone in academia writes a study, 500 academics cheer it, it's then reported in Newsweek, picked up in the New York Times, they make a movie on it or write a Broadway play on it, and pretty much that's how people get to know things that aren't really true. Right, well Amazon and Netflix are both collectively spending 10 billion on new content. And in these internet huge pipelines, we don't have any rating system. We don't have any of the typical um, beware. And so you, I'm sure you've watched some of the new Netflix genre. What's your take on all that? I mean, Apple's getting into the space. Facebook's getting into the space. I mean, the proliferation of media in the future is going to have a whole new face on it. 
Yeah, it's kind of the Wild West out there. Um, and normally it's something that would be um, alarming, and some of it is, but I think that there's also in that a lot of opportunity. Uh, there's um, a, a technological gale of creative destruction that's blowing through uh, industries. It's already transformed. It's wiped out some industries. Uh, being a travel agent isn't all that viable as a job anymore, for example. Um, but it hasn't fully come to education. Uh, it's coming to media. Um, and uh, so I think for those of us who feel that that there have been these crusty monopolies that are imposing ideas on us, forcing, if you will, political correctness on us, uh, able to create conventional wisdom, even on, on, um, uh, out of thin air, so to speak. Um, this is not a bad thing, um, because it means that it creates new channels of information. So, for example, I mentioned the world of comedy. You know, ordinarily, you can't compete with that. Remember, these comedians like Bill Maher started out in improvs in L.A. and Chicago when they were 19 years old. Uh, we have to cultivate that kind of talent on our side. Well, today you can create a web channel of, you know, for young comedians and get them to do stand-up every day and let the market decide. And r relatively inexpensively, you can begin to counter this kind of stuff and, and cultivate the talent that needs to be cultivated. Um, to, to rival the, the dominant forces out there. Just before we get into the vision that you have now for higher ed, uh, I do want to comment about the reality of um, some of these voices in the country. I mean, we, we've got a very uh, controversial president um, who, in many ways, who has a great sympathy for the conservatives. But it's almost like the whole country is in an absolute uproar. And, um, and y y for all the reasons you've clearly delineated. I mean, seated deep in the DOJ and all of these different organizations. I mean, how long does it take to really get the right players in the right positions to make government functional where it's not just total gridlock and fighting and what we're watching on CNN and Fox every night? Yeah, I think what's happened in America is that in the 80s, and this continued in the early 90s, American politics was kind of a gentleman's fight. And by that I mean that there was a general sense on the right and the left that we agreed on goals and we disagreed about means. Obviously, we all wanted the country to be strong. We thought America should exercise a positive influence in the world. We thought America should be the world's leader. We'd like to see a very prosperous country, uh, and also a country where, uh, essentially, we, we pursue strong communities, strong families, and so on. And the argument was about what to do with that prosperity, and what does it mean to be the world's leader? Uh, how do we, does it mean military force, or does it mean what one, one scholar calls soft power? So the disagreements were about technique, you might say. Uh, but all of that kind of um, broke down, I think, starting with Clinton, but really continuing with Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, so for the first time, for example, the government began to deploy the instruments of the state against its critics. Mm -hmm. Now, previously, uh, you know, I don't think it would have crossed Jimmy Carter's mind, and let alone JFK or Truman, to use the IRS against their critics or to deploy SWAT teams against people who disagreed with them. So this represented a breakdown of civility that, uh, I mean, I was embroiled in it myself, um, that essentially created a declaration of war between the two sides. And that's how we got Trump, because the Republicans basically said that, you know, we've basically got all these, you know, men who run around in women's bonnets, you know, and they get, they get hammered by the media, they get humiliated, um, and they don't know how to throw a punch. And so the left is operating like gangsters, and we kind of need a bit of a mob boss on our side who will... So out of the rough and tumble of American politics, I see Trump as the response, and in fact, a necessary response to this kind of craziness that's been going on. Um, and uh, it's, it, it's reached a very bad point. So a restoration is going to certainly take, at the very least, some time. Do you think he's going to survive all the attacks? I think he will, but I also think that there is a very serious, it's not an exaggeration to call it a coup attempt underway. Mm -hmm. And by that I mean, look, if, you know, if Trump's been colluding one-on-one -on -one with Putin to fix the election, then that's not allowed. He should be impeached. 
Uh, I don't think he's done that. Uh, I think the left's view is we have to get him on something. It doesn't matter what, and it doesn't matter if it's plausible or not, as long as we can make it stick. So you, you essentially have these extra legal, you may say, arms of, of the state. Um, you know, people talk about the right, sometimes talk about the deep state. But to me, it's not the deep state. It's, the problem isn't really the FBI or the CIA, although there, there are problems there. Uh, it's really the complicity of the private um, uh, organs of the left, like the universities or like the media. You know, when Hugo Chavez in Venezuela wanted to bring the media to heel, he essentially had to go threaten and blackmail reporters, shut down newspapers. That's typically what communists and fascists have done. In our country, you don't have to do that. Obama and Hillary have to do nothing. The mm -hmm. media is only too willing to subordinate themselves to the agenda of the left. Um, so um, the, um, the, the truth is that, that we've been in this rough political climate. I think there's an, there's, Trump is coming in from the outside. He does not respect the conventional boundaries of politics. To my way of thinking on the balance, that's a good thing. It's not always a good thing, but in general it's a good thing because um, those boundaries have been erected by our adversaries and they're a way of keeping us in line. And Trump, Trump's also a pop culture figure. And so while everyone says, oh, get him off the Twitter and so on, the people who say that know nothing about Twitter. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't realize the power of that. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only unfiltered way for the president to reach the American people uninterrupted by the interpretive lens put on by CNN and ABC. Um, and, you know, again, the more closely you watch these people, the more closely you realize that they're not really journalists. And by that I mean if you gave them scandalous information on Nancy Pelosi, they would not report it. Mm -hmm. So a journalist is out for the story. He doesn't care where the chips are going to fall. That's a journalist. Uh, these are partisans masquerading as journalists. And, and Trump is the first president to call them out on it. Now Reagan had sort of an ability to go over the heads of the media. but. But that was an, essentially, essentially Reagan created an exception of one. He was able to do that, but none of his successors were. So, you know, as, as a Republican, I would watch with dismay as, you know, George H.W. Bush or W. They just seemed to be standing in the line of fire like one of those, you know, ha, you know helpless wildebeest that was being pursued by a hyena. Uh, and, 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 and then just stood there looking dazed as their, you know, being, entrails were being eaten from the inside. Uh, Trump doesn't let that happen. I like that about him. Yeah, I do too. So let's talk about the future of higher ed. We, we reprinted an article in the Wall Street Journal. David Glinter said that n 10 years from now, 90% of universities are going to be out of business. And he talked about that uh, we, we are creating or have historically created an education that's kind of been a this is the menu eat it, kind of like going to a restaurant and we don't have a lot of flexibility. Uh, you are now looking into higher ed and can you share your vision? Yeah, higher education <clears throat> is, um, well first of all, I, I don't think it will be obsolete in 10 years. Remember that higher education is it's something that is um, imbued in the American psyche. The simple notion of like sending your kids off to college. I mean, that's just an American ritual, not all that different from getting married, for example. Or so that I so I think that, and there are established universities that have this kind of exercise, this tyrannical sway over the minds of people, including me. Uh, so my daughter just graduated from Dartmouth. Now we might say, well, why do you send her to Dartmouth in the first place? You know that's a left-wing cesspool, and you know that she's going to be bombarded on all sides, and you know that her faith is going to be under siege from start to finish. Uh, and I do know those things. And, and had she been a very delicate kid, I might say, you know what? She's going to come out so battered and bruised that I, I can't possibly take the risk of sending her there. But, but because I thought, oh, this is a pretty self-confident kid, and I think that in some way she's going to be seasoned by the battle of all that. And I also realized that that credential, that stamp, even if she learned absolutely nothing, would still be a very good traveling passport uh, through life. And so that's going to be with us for a while. Uh, I, uh, but I do think that, that disruptive technologies and, and new ways of thinking are going to change all this, but they'll change it not at the top, they'll change it starting at the bottom and in the middle and then it will slowly make its way through the, the system so that I would say in 25, maybe, maybe 30 years, we'll have a completely different landscape. 
so uh, 10 years ago, the iPhone wasn't even in existence. When, you know what it's like when you walk into the gate of an airport now. Everybody's got their head stuck in an iPhone and this digital delivery. You worked in these conservative think tanks for years. You've been a polarizing figure for conservatism. What, what are you working on? Well, I, um, I, I mentioned the three kind of megaphones of the left, uh, academia, the media, and Hollywood. So the, when I look at it, I see that in those areas, the conservatives are doing fairly minimal things. So what are they doing in, in, in academia? By and large, the general conservative approach has been send speakers to campus to counter the prevailing. But look, I mean, even if you send out you know, Ben Shapiro or me or whoever, we go on a Monday, we leave on a Tuesday, the professors are there every day. Um, now, there are alternative institutions, a la Hillsdale College. Um, but the academic landscape in general remains undisturbed. Just think of the, the fat and happy, you know, liberal professor sitting at Iowa State, for example. That guy is untouchable. The state legislature can't really touch him or won't. The administration has a relatively limited sway over him. He doesn't care what parents think. Uh, and he rules tyrannically over his students. So this guy does not feel that his life or his livelihood is threatened in the slightest by anything. And he, he feels he's going to be there or his counterpart's going to be there forever, a century from now. So the question I ask in, when I think about all these things is, how do I shake that guy's world? How, how do I figure out a way to, because change has to come at that level. And it has to, so, you know, we're in a small way doing our part to try to plant flags in these hostile institutions. So my foray into documentary films was aimed at saying, you know, Michael Moore is the king of the genre. You look at the top 10 political movies ever made, he's got five of them. Uh, now I have three. Uh, and our record is better because he's made 20 movies, he's got five, I've made three, I've got three. Um, but I also realized that the big guy in Hollywood is not Michael Moore, it's um, Steven Spielberg. So if you really want to compete in Hollywood, you've got to make romantic comedies, thrillers, animated family films. So we're actually starting to do that. We're starting to make feature films to compete in the sort of, we may say, coveted space of Hollywood. Um, uh, similarly, I think with higher education, transformation is going to have to come in effect by building the academic iPhone. And what I mean by that is that, imagine if you know, Jobs had come out and said, look, I've got a, I got a phone and it has the internet, but that's kind of all it has, and I'm working on it. No, it's like you have to do the whole thing and release it in one shot, and then, and then people go, oh wow, that's the future of phones. The rotary phone is basically obsolete, or this is where the world is going. Um, and I think ultimately in higher education, the same deal. There are new types of education that are sort of being envisioned, but they need to be built. So what are you working on? Well, I've um, <clears throat> teamed up with some partners and we're looking at new ways of doing online education. Um, and describe the problem in this way, that uh, there is online education. There's online education uh, with places like Strayer and the University of Phoenix and so on. Uh, as you know, many colleges are either have or are going to moving into the online space. All the elite schools are, they recognize the importance of online education. Now, um, one of the problems for places like Harvard and Stanford is that they can offer an online education, but they don't want to give away an, uh, their degrees. Harvard could probably have 100,000 Harvard graduates graduating every year by teaching online all over the world, but they don't want 100,000 Harvard degrees given out every year. It devalues the Harvard. Scarcity is the actual value of the Harvard degree. So their online is almost, you can say, exhibitionistic, where you can take their course and they might give you some sort of a, a token certificate, but it's not a real degree. And so at the end of the day, that's not a, a real solution. Um, most colleges are simply taking their professors and putting them online. And, um, and um, this is a big challenge because it's hard enough to keep students in the class attentive. Um, you do it basically by having them sit in front of you and make it embarrassing for them to leave. But you take that same kid and put him at home uh, with a remote control and then say, how do I have him keep that remote control listening to a professor, let's say of romance languages or of history uh, for 40 minutes straight that's a totally different challenge. So uh, I think that um, uh, there needs to be new ways of doing online education that are responsive to the 
you know, the fact that our, uh, we're living in an impatient world, people switch the channel all the time, they learn differently. I think even the mind is a little different now than it was, let's say, 25 years ago. I have no trouble sitting and li listening to a lecture for 60 minutes. If it's a good lecture, I'm riveted. Uh, the old Dartmouth was, you know, these spectacular orators who would essentially perform like actors on a stage, sometimes in costume, and I love that stuff. Uh, but that is becoming a little bit of an obsolete model, and I'm not even sure it works that well if once you put it on a screen. Um, the screen creates new realities. So by, because we do documentary films and now moving into feature films, we think of education in a sort of cinematic way. Okay, so, I mean, help me understand the, the cinematic approach to education. What, what, what is it going to be? Is it going to be a think tank? Is it... Are you, are you collecting some of the great conservative minds who want to forever kind of have a rebuttal to all of this nonsense we read in the New York Times and the major publications to inculcate young people? Well, you know, it is true that uh, the think tanks, I mean, first of all, the think tanks are, they're doing education, but they're not doing higher education. They're doing political education. So you think, for example, of a place like uh, AEI, my old stomping ground. Uh, AEI tends to forage the universities and find professors uh, who are doing work in immigration and taxes, bring them to AEI. Now, think of that. That's a little bit of a tricky transaction, because first of all, there are probably only a half dozen conservative professors, let's just say, at the you know, University of Texas and at Austin. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be pulling three of them and bringing them to AEI, where they won't be teaching any students at all, but will just be publishing in a newsletter or doing a conference and meeting donors and so on. So the think tanks do what they do, but they don't really do, they don't hand out degrees, they don't really do education. Uh, so it is true that I, it's occurred to me, look, you've got all these you know, terrific teachers, and Newt, there's Newt Gingrich, there's uh, Charles Murray at AEI, there was, of course, Milton Friedman used to be at Hoover. Uh, it would be really great to harness these guys to be able to teach in a, in a, in a a wide audience, um, not just of students, but also of adults. On, on the list of priorities that you have in front of you, how high is this priority? Well, it's a, um, um, it's a big deal, right? I mean, if you think about it, not a lot of universities get started or founded. And um, when you think through something new, you've got to get it right. So. Uh, I, we're a small team that's been sort of working through the details of all this, and I think we, ha we had to work out a whole bunch of kinks. Uh, the biggest one, of course, was the accreditation kink. Mm -hmm. uh, we explored a lot of options that range from buying a campus that's going underground, going bankrupt, uh, to ap applying for new accreditation, and um, so that's, that's a big one. Then there are smaller uh, operational kinks. I mean, a, an obvious one would be, for example, Look, uh, parents in general are used to sending their kids off to college. Presumably in an online university, you don't have to do that. Your kid could technically stay at home. Well, is that something that parents want? Um, oh, another thing is a lot of people believe that education occurs around the table through a kind of informal exchange of ideas or the ability to ask a professor a question uh, right in the classroom and right there. Now, you know, in reality, uh, studies have shown that relatively few students actually do that, and very little genuine discussion occurs in a lot of campuses mm -hmm. around the table, but that's still the mythology of liberal education. So the question then becomes, in the mind of parents, and, and maybe young people too, how can you really do this, you may say, online, through your computer? How, how can you actually replicate the unique conversational world of the universe? You think of Socrates in the streets of Athens interacting. Uh, that's, our, that's our liberal education model. And so we have to think of, when you have a new technology, you, you gain some things and you lose some things. And you have to think about how you can strengthen your gains and minimize your losses, so how you, how you can recreate the things that you're going to inherently lose by not having 20 guys sitting in a room talking. You know, we're talking to Dinesh Souza, the celebrated author, documentarian at Houston Baptist University. Just before we wrap up, you know, who is the Obama in the wings? The DNC has got this extreme left thing that seems to be not registering with a lot of Americans. But they're obviously not sitting around doing nothing. I mean, what's going to be the, 
give me the the forecast four and eight years from now. There's a sort of, um, in my view, uh, uh, kind of a debt struggle that's going on in American politics between uh, two groups. And in, in fact, only one group knows it's fighting. The other group sort of doesn't. Um, on the one side, I, I would call it the wealth creators, the entrepreneurs, people who create wealth. Uh, these are people who are used to making things, uh, making something where there wasn't something before. The iPhone is a classic example, or even the whole Silicon Valley, the whole idea of taking sand or silicon and converting it into technology and workable instruments of all kinds. That's wealth creation in its classic form. Um, uh, progressivism, uh, the loose term progressive, r really refers to rule by experts. It refers to a group of people, generally not wealth creators. These are typically by profession attorneys, they're academics, they're journalists. These are essentially people in the knowledge or word business. They, they create words. And their job is, they, they think, they're the smartest guys in the country. The, uh, and they, they don't want to disrupt the entrepreneurs from creating wealth, but they want to disrupt the entrepreneurs from controlling it. So, you know, Bernie Sanders doesn't want to come to Midland, Texas and take oil out of the ground. It, that cons nothing could be further from his mind than to do that. He wants the people in Midland to do that. They frack, they get the oil out, they put it in drums, they label it. And then the progressives want to kind of waltz in and say, okay, guys, we'll take this over right now. Thanks, good job, go home. We'll deploy the wealth as we, so, so which group should rule America? The entrepreneurs who take market signals and make stuff, or the progressives who think that they're the knowledge class and should organize society. That's the whole point of community organizing on a national scale, um, the Obamas of the world. That's what the fight's about at the end of the day. Um, uh, below the surface, and everything else is disguised. Now, the, the, the progressives have a weapon, and that is the moral weapon, social justice. Uh, they don't even claim to be doing it to make things more efficient. They know they can't do that. Uh, but they're, in effect, saying that, that they are promoting the common good. They are promoting what's just. They're making a moral attack on the wealth creators, and the wealth creators uh, do not know how to answer that attack and typically go into a kind of hunker down mode. Um, this is why Trump is actually very interesting because remember how Romney got savaged for his wealth. Now sure. Trump has greater wealth, but no one savages Trump. Why? Because you can't. If you accuse him of being rich, he tells you he's richer than you think. Right? He boasts about how rich he is. He would come into Forbes when they would be doing the Forbes 400 with his accountants to prove that he belongs higher on the list than, whereas most rich guys want to ca camouflage their wealth and they don't want to be on the Forbes list because for all kinds of reasons. Uh, so that's Trump. He's, you know, he's out there. And, uh, but to my mind, we're not living in a normal time and therefore the abnormality of Trump is to me actually quite acceptable. <laughs> Dinesh D'Souza, thank you for being with us, and we look forward to your repeat visits to HBU in the days ahead. Thank you.